Hi everyone and welcome to Forest Health 101 where we discuss everything Forest Health. I'm your host Damien and today we're going to be talking about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid with Dr. Robert Jutan. Robert is an associate professor with North Carolina State University and he focuses on forest entomology, invasive species and population genetics. So let's dive right into it. Dr. Robert Jutan, associate professor with NC State. Welcome. Thanks for joining today. No, oh, no. Damien, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've seen each other last year, I think, around July at uh, a conference uh, back in Seth Week. So it's been a, it's been a few months since then. Yeah, it has been. You were you were here visiting us in Raleigh for Seth Week. That's right. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So really, really excited about um, start talking about the hemlock woolly adelgid. This is uh, a pest that. I've seen quite a lot, uh, you know, going like kind of like traveling and hiking, but I never had the chance to work specifically with this. So, uh, yeah, I have like a, a few questions um, about it for sure. And and you guys kind of like released this this new paper on um, canopy gaps and, you know, the effect of that of, of, of the health of um, Eastern Hemlock. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that before we start. Uh, Please introduce yourself. What's your uh, main research line, research topics, and, and where you are actually located? Yeah, so well, as you said, I'm an associate professor at NC State University. I'm housed in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources. Um, so I have a primarily research and teaching appointment, um, conduct research on the ecology and management of invasive forest insects. Um, as well as uh, some issues related to population genetics and conservation of threatened tree species, right? And um, as far as my teaching goes, I teach the forest health course in our forest management curriculum here at NC State. I also have a small appointment with a group called CAMCOR, uh, which is one of our uh, cooperative programs uh, here at NC State. So we're an industry research cooperative that works directly with forest industry, primarily in the Southern Hemisphere, right? Uh, so Latin America, Southern and Eastern Africa, Indonesia, um, on issues related to tree breeding and tree improvement. And I support that group in the area of insects and diseases. And you know, what, how can we uh, inform our breeding strategies as they relate to helping overcome issues with pests and pathogens? So, um, and it yeah. is through my my job with Camcor that I actually first met you. Exactly. And, yeah, we actually uh, met uh, how long ago? Twelve years ago? Thirteen years ago? Yeah. So I was it's looked been at a while. this. <laughs> it has been a while. I looked at this. It was my second visit to um, Uruguay for Camcor, um, and that was in 2011. Right? There you go. Wow. A yeah. while ago. It, yeah, it was a long time ago. And you were working. I believe you were working on some of the invasive uh, bark beetle. Issues yeah, there. exactly. I was I was doing my masters back then. Uh, started my masters that year on invasive bark beetles in uh, commercial lowlily pine. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I remember we we're, were discussing some topics on uh, eucalyptus, uh, the bronze bug. I think yeah, you were right. uh, doing some research on some plots. Uh, so how how long have you been with um, with Camcor? So I guess like it has taken you all over the place. Yeah. So I started with Camcor in two thousand and five. Um, and that was really sort of my postdoc. It wasn't a call to postdoc, but that's essentially uh, what it was. And I was brought in uh, to develop a domestic gene conservation program for CAMCOR based in the United States, working primarily on hemlocks. And mm -hmm. the, the goal was to conserve hemlock uh, germplasm uh, to help preserve the species. And, and CAMCOR has a long history of not just tree breeding, but conserving tree species through gene conservation strategies. Um, and they had this new project and they need look, they were looking for someone with a strong background on hemlock and a little bit of uh, knowledge on forest genetics it, that kind of uh, at the time uh, definitely defined me um, and so I got that position and so in a couple of years after that's when they started utilizing me in the international program as well and I got to travel and so my work with Camcor has been fascinating I've got to try I've been able to travel all over the world it's, I've been very fortunate so, um, how many how many times you were in in Uruguay? Oh, Uruguay! I've been there uh, at least ten times, and I wow. have to say, I've I've traveled a lot of places. I've traveled extensively throughout uh, Central and South America. Um, and if anyone ever asks me, like, where's a good country to visit for a first visit to South America, I always say Uruguay. 
right? That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I have to ask, what is the favorite part of all the times you've been like there? You said 10 times of that. What's the favorite part of being there? I, it's honestly, I mean, obviously people talk about the food and the beef, <laughs> right? And get some good steaks, outstanding wine, right? Do we there you enjoy go. some good wine, right? Some good tonight, some good hearty tonight. Uh, but for me, it's the people. Uh, and you're a perfect example of that. Uruguayan <laughs> people are some of the nicest and most laid back people in the world. And I've, everyone I've met there, I'm still friends with. And uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's awesome. Yeah, I, I still travel there uh, once a year for sure for you know holidays, vacation, and and Christmas. But yeah, absolutely. I feel like a lot of people that I've met that have visited the country will say you know very similar things. So mm -hmm. um, very very kind words. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, uh, well deserved. Well deserved. <laughs> so let's uh, let's start talking about the uh, the woolly adelgid. Um, so you know, for people that have not been in touch with these species at all. Um, you know, let's start by the basics. What is it and why it's important? Right. Okay. So hemlock woolly adelgid is a small, we'll call it an aphid-like insect, right? Um, so it's a hemipteran um, that is native to Japan, right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually native. You know, it's native to Asia and the Western United States. But the particular adelgid we have here um, in Eastern North America came from Japan. Right, and it is a pest of hemlock species, so trees in the genus Suga, right? And so um, came in, was first detected in the Richmond, Virginia area in the early 1950s. So it probably okay. been introduced some number of years before that. We're almost certain it was on uh, Suga cyboldii, southern Japanese hemlock nursery stock that was brought in for planting, mm -hmm. right? Plants for planting, a common pathway for pest yeah. and pathogen introductions. Um, yeah, and it's since it's kind of slowly spread in the urban landscape for a few decades before it reached the Blue Ridge Mountains and our native hemlock stands in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it has since uh, really spread its range north and south um, throughout our native hemlock forests and has caused a tremendous amount of hemlock dieback and mortality in our in our Appalachian forests. So basically 70 years ago, that's when it was introduced and now it's kind of like still spreading. Like what is the current distribution? It's kind of like the Appalachian forests or? Yeah, it, that, that's a good question. It's a little bit hard to answer. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so we have two species of hemlock um, in Eastern North America, Eastern hemlock, or sometimes people refer to it as uh, Canada hemlock. Mm -hmm. It has a large geographic distribution from eastern Canada all the way down into the southern Appalachians to a little uh, pocket that occurs in Alabama on the Talladega National Forest. Um, and then it also spreads over into the upper Midwest, so Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, uh, the upper peninsula of Wisconsin, and just a little bit over into Minnesota. Um, and then there's Carolina hemlock, which occurs just in the southern Appalachian Mountains, um, predominantly in the state of North Carolina, in our uh, western North Carolina mountains, um, a little bit in South Carolina, a little bit in Tennessee, a little bit in Virginia as well. Um, interestingly, it's called Carolina hemlock because it was actually first described in a population in South Carolina, right, which is where I'm from. I grew up in the upstate of South Carolina, so I take a little bit of pride in that. <laughs> you know, even though most of the most of the trees populations occur in North Carolina. Um, and I could say the adelgid has occupied the it's occupied the entire range of Carolina hemlock or infested it. And it's throughout most of the all of the southern and mid-Atlantic range of eastern hemlock um, and starting to work its way up into New England, mm. um, into northern New York. And it's moved a little bit into Michigan. Um, but it's not very adaptable to extreme cold winter weather. Gotcha. Um, so if you look at a range map of it, you'll see that like in Maine, it's not really worked its way very well into the interior of Maine, but it's hugging those coastal hemlock forests uh, where there's some moderation of winter temperatures due to the, due to the ocean water. Um, and it, it's hot from there over to Nova Scotia as well. So, God. so basically it's kind of like in, in the limit of the distribution where it could actually be. Yeah. Well, it, unless it is able to adapt. Right yeah. to those cold and, winter temperatures, and in terms of like the spread, it's being more like natural spread, or there is some other pathway uh, locally how it's actually been moving around. Uh, well, I, yeah, it's an insect that is passively dispersed. Right, it doesn't. It's not an active disperser. 
Um, so it does catch a ride on the wind. Um, animals like uh, migratory birds can move it. They can pick up the crawler stage, which is the first instar nymph, mm -hmm. um, and move it around. Uh, humans, we've moved it around a good bit um, as well. So kind of all of the sort of passive pathways that things get moved around, um, it definitely applies to the indulgent as well. Yeah. And, and in terms of, of the damage, we're saying that initially it was, you know, a problem in urban landscapes, urban forests, and then kind of slowly moved into natural forests. But in terms of the damage that the insect is producing um, is because of the feeding. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's a piercing sucking insect, mm -hmm. right? So the first install star crawler nymph settles at the base of the hemlock needle, inserts its feeding stylet, um, and it's really targeting xylem rays or xylem ray parenchyma, so storage cells where the trees are storing a lot of nutrients and starch and things like that. So it is depleting um, those uh, stored nutrients from the tree. And so that affects the tree's ability to then produce new growth and new reproductive buds and things like that. So, uh, and that's that's critical to, when we get to talk about canopy gaps, we'll come back to that, mm -hmm. that topic. but. Yeah, that, that's kind of what it's doing. It's just sucking the tree dry of all its uh, stored nutrients. So basically in this, you know, uh, reduced growth that you guys are seeing, uh, does it mean that it will make it more susceptible to other uh, issues like pathogens or secondary insects that would take advantage of this situation or not really? I, I mean, I think in a general sense, like we talk about with a lot of forest health issues, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of insect and disease attacks. Yeah, secondary insects and disease um, are an issue. Um, in some cases, but I usually don't see a lot of evidence of that until the tree has really declined a significant amount. So it's pretty much almost dead, right? So really most of the really severe impacts and reduction in growth is happening happening as a direct consequence of the adelgid feeding on the tree. Gotcha. So you, I would imagine that you would also see some like uh, dieback of some of the branches. Uh, what are some of like the symptoms or like signs that you can actually... Uh, notice on, you know, kind of like attacks of, of, of the Delgid? Yeah. So initially when the, you can have a really heavily infested tree, right? Um, and you can't really tell looking at it from a distance, the tree will still look relatively healthy. Um, kind of the first signs you'll start to see is um, the tree each year, the amount of new growth it produces is less and less when it does a mm -hmm. new growth flush. Uh, eventually that stops um, and you'll start seeing uh, dead branch tips in the canopy of the tree. Um, and then that just slowly progresses into larger and larger sections of branch dying back. And as that is happening, the tree is turning from this really beautiful deep green color that we associate with a healthy hemlock. Uh, and it turns very yellowish, right? It gets very mm. chlorotic. Um, and eventually it, the needles just kind of turn this when the tree actually just kind of gives up and dies, um, you still have a lot of needles on the trees, but everything just looks kind of this grayish color, very drab. And we call those hemlocks gray ghosts, right? It's very descriptive uh, when you see it. And it'll stay in that stage for a little bit before the tree's fully just kind of desiccated and um, all of the needles fall off. And, and in terms of a good sign for an adelgid issue, uh, the underneath of the leaves, that's where they usually will hang out and start feeding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, getting, you know, seeing the insect itself. So you flip over a, a branch. And again, I said those insects, all they settle at the base of the needles. And yeah. they're called woolly adelgids because as they mature, they produce this white wool. You know, it's a waxy substance, but it looks like wool. So at the base of each of the hemlock needles, it'll be like a really small little cotton ball, right? Um, and inside that cotton ball is an adult female in the eggs um, that she's laying. Um, and yeah, that's the first sign if you see that. Um, yeah. that you have so there shouldn't it, right? be any other uh, insects, even like native insects that kind of like resembles that um, that pattern. Like this is very characteristic of the, the woolly adelgid. Yeah, on hemlock, right? We have native yeah. woolly adelgids on other species. Uh, but on hemlock, yeah, there's not going to be anything else that looks quite like um, hemlock woolly adelgid. You kind of, sometimes people will, you know, 
at the university, we get sent in pictures all the time, right? Yeah. Um, and people are, oh, I have the adelgid on my tree, but it'll be like a little bit of spider web or something like that. So there, or even a, a, pi- a little pile of bird poop or something like that, which mm. can be mistaken for it. But when you really compare those things, nothing looks quite like the adelgid on the yeah. tree. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in, in terms of, of management, and I imagine like, you know, this is uh, kind of like the typical case where everything that we're talking for is health, that we have a, a, an integrated pest management program. So many different uh, approaches to deal with this insect. Can you talk a little bit about what is, you know, the current management that we have or like in terms of options, both for natural forests, but also like urban landscapes as well? Yeah. Okay. So for both of those situations, right, uh, your primary line of defense um, in an urban setting is obviously going to be chemical management, right? And chemical insecticides. And we rely heavily on uh, systemic neonicotinoids, so okay. uh, imidacloprid and dinotefurin, right? Um, imidacloprid has, usually it's applied as a soil drench, um, okay. and it's taken up through the roots and goes systemic in the tree. That uptake is slow, right? It takes a few months, but it gives you very long-term control once it, once it takes act, take, takes mm. hold in the tree. And we can get five or more years of control from a single application, which is great. Um, the dinotefurin so, sometimes goes under the trade name Safari. Um, it is much quicker to uptake. It goes into the tree much more quickly and provides very quick knockdown, but it doesn't persist in the tree as, that for long. as long, right? Gotcha. So, and that can be applied to the soil or it can be applied as a basal bark spray. Um, gotcha. And those are often used in combination, particularly in a severe situation where you have a heavily infested tree and you want to get quick knockdown of the insect Mm -hmm. population and then long-term control. So there's no injection option uh, for treating these these trees? There are injection options, right? But those carry extra costs because you have to buy the equipment to apply those. But a lot of people do use Mm -hmm. um, the injection for those chemicals. Um, but some people don't like it because you dr- you drill a hole into the tree right? yeah. to do yeah. that. And that you, by doing that, you're creating an infection court, right? So you could potentially get root rot fungus or something in there, right? Because you're doing that down on the root flares at the base of the yeah. tree. So, there, yeah, trade-offs to doing that. So, <laughs> um, but it's, it's usually with those two chemicals that um, we know that actually, like, it's effective for managing this. Yeah. So those are the gotcha. workhorse for adult gotcha. management, and they're highly effective. and. Um, and they work really well in the um, urban and sort of ornamental landscape. Mm-hmm. And we utilize them heavily in forest landscapes as well, but more focused on high-value trees, right, in recreation areas or along trails, mm-hmm. um, things like that. Um, there's also an accessibility issue because, you, you know, often with these chemicals, you're going to have to carry water in with you, right? So yeah. you know, how feasible is it to get those chemicals out there in like the back country in the Southern Appalachian? Some of that happens, uh, but, you know, really we think of it more of those really high value trees. So very targeted treatments um, yeah. in the natural forests. So. And in terms of other type of management, uh, you know, thinking not only in the chemical approach, but other options. Yeah, so the so the we think about the IPM toolbox for uh, hemlock woolly adelgid chemical controls. You know, kind of the first tool we pull out. The second tool is biological control, right? And that's mm-hmm. classical biological control. So, a number of different predators that have been evaluated, and a handful of those are being actively released mm-hmm. uh, for management of hemlock woolly adelgid populations. Um, and they're all predators. There are no known parasitoids um, okay. that attack adelgids. So everything's predator-based. Most of the emphasis have been put on what are uh, the beetle Laracobius nigrinus and Laracobius osakensis, or the Larry beetles. Um, Laracobius nigrinus is from the Pacific Northwest, right? So if we back up just a little bit. Hemlock woolly adelgid is actually native to the hemlock forest of Western North America, and it has predators there that are feeding on it. Um, and so Laracobius nigritis was brought to the east and went through all the normal non-target testing under quarantine and was approved for release. Uh, same thing for Osakensis, but it comes from Japan, right, where our strain of the adelgid is from. 
Um, and now the new kid on the block in biocontrol is called Leucotraxis or silverflies. Um, and there's two species. Um, they're bringing them from the West Coast and releasing mm -hmm. them in the hemlock forest here. Uh, we have the same species of Leucotraxis in the east, but they don't feed on hemlock woolly adelgid. They're not sort of habituated to feed on it, right? Mm. So they don't have a search image for it. So they are bringing the Leucotraxis from the West Coast. Um, Laracobius beetles are establishing, uh, very well established in the landscape, right? And so that's the first step, get them established. And then as their populations build, we'll start to hopefully get evidence that, you know, they're going to be part of the management solution long term. And there already is evidence that Laracobius is going to be an important part of that. Awesome. Uh, Leucotraxis is still very much in the research and development phase, uh, working on strategies to promote establishment yeah. of the Western strains in the yeah. East. How, how long have these uh, releases uh, of this, you know, different products have been happening in the hemlock distribution? Yeah, so the fir the very first predators were probably being released in the late nineties, okay. mid to late nineties. Um, that was a species called Sasagi skimnus, which was a little coccinella beetle. Millions of those were released, um, but then attention turned to the Laracobius, and yeah. those started probably the late nineties, um, early two thousands, mid two thousands, um, as it was approved for free release. Um, and they're still like not like in their active release, like these programs are still happening uh, across the range, right? Yeah, there's mass rearing programs. Uh, Laracobius, a lot of the effort now is on redistribution from areas where it's established. So mm -hmm. there are still rearing labs for that species. Um, but a, a lot of states that have uh, well-established populations are, are moving them around to get them into mm -hmm. new areas. Osakensis is still being lab reared um, for release um, as well. So hmm, Interesting. I would imagine as any IPM program, um, you guys look into monitoring surveillance programs as well. Um, but in terms of things like host uh, host resistance, is that has that been explored as well? Yeah, so the bulk of the attention on IPM at this point has been given to um, chemical control and biological control, less to okay. host resistance. Um, there are some programs uh, out there that are looking into that question. Um, and... Um, there's, we still have a long way. There's some evidence that um, maybe some hemlocks are lingering in the forest. Um, and maybe that means that they have some level of resistance to the adelgid. Mm -hmm. um, gotcha. You know, hopefully that's the case. Um, but we also know, and as we talk, we'll talk about the canopy gaps. Uh, we know the environment that that tree is in plays a huge role in how long it survives in the forest. So, uh, that, so this is kind of, a, I'm kind of stumbling over this because I don't want to offend anyone, but uh, <laughs> there are people looking at resistance. Um, and I think it's an area we need to dive into more, yeah. uh, but it, not as much work has been done there. Gotcha. Pe people have looked at interspecific hybrids because we do know uh, the Asian species have some amount of resistance to the adelgid. Mm. Um, so there have been attempts to cross the species and to kind of do a, a American chestnut back cross breeding type approach. Hybrid crosses are were successful for Carolina hemlock with okay. the Asian species, but not with eastern hemlock. Um, so far, eastern hemlock will not cross with any of the other species. And that's an interesting thing. And, and the reason that is is because even though Carolina hemlock occurs in the southern Appalachians and is sympatric with eastern hemlock in the south, genetically, it's most closely related to the Asian species, mm. right? So it's a, it's an ancestor of those species. So it, yeah. it crosses with those. So, nice. and that's another possible avenue for resistance. Yeah, yeah. And, and so basically you guys, uh, during your study, you looked at, you know, canopy gaps, that's kind of like a silvicultural approach, something that, um, I guess it's not always explored as an option for management, which, so walk us through a little bit about the, the, the whole process. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you're 100% right. We often, particularly with an invasive species, we think almost always we're looking at chemical controls and biological controls. And we don't really think about silviculture as a possibility. Yeah. And kind of the way that we got started on this, and I should stop and here and say my primary collaborator on this work is uh, Bud Mayfield with the Southern Research Station, mm -hmm. my partner in crime on this, and with some <laughs> good advice from Rusty Ray with Forest Health Protection. Um 
I don't know, it's probably, it's more than 10 years ago now, um, we started talking about, is there a silvicultural approach? Because we're out there talking to land managers and these are foresters out there managing these lands and they're happy to work with chemicals and biological control, but they want to do active management, more active management. So they were asking, are there opportunities to apply silviculture? You know, we always talk about stand thinning and how that helps uh, improve tree health and resilience to mm -hmm. uh, disturbance, right? You know, Southern pine beetle and stand thinning being a really great example of that. Absolutely. Right? Um, and they want to know, can we do something the similar. And so Bud and I started talking about it a little bit. And, um, you know, if you walk around a forest that's been heavily impacted by hemlock woolly adelgid, um, you'll start seeing all these hemlocks where all of the lower branches of the tree are dead, right? Um, it, Eastern hemlock is our most shade tolerant tree species in the East, right? And so even it, when it's part of a mixed forest, because it's shade tolerant, its lower branches, its branches that are down under the canopy should still be alive and still be green, have needles mm -hmm. on them, right? So that's what a, a, a healthy eastern hemlock will look like. Um, and what we started noticing are well, these lollipop trees, right? These hemlocks where every, every branch on the tree has died except for the very top of the tree that sticks out into the sunlight, right? And that is the part of the tree that would hang on and survive the longest, it doesn't survive forever. Eventually, the adelgid will, will, will overcome it. But, but it those trees happen. will, yeah, those trees will, the, that top of the tree will live uh, for a number of years after the rest of the tree is done. Mm -hmm. We could see the same thing, like if it was a stand edge tree, right, where uh, just the branches that hang out into the sun at the edge of the stand are the last branches on the tree to die, right? And so I don't think it takes a genius to realize if you look at those situations, right? Well, there's something going on with sunlight here. Yeah. There, let's let's try to thin some stands and see what happens, right? That was uh, what got us going on it. But we we knew that before we went to a, a land manager, say Pisgah National Forest, and said, "Hey, we want to cut some gaps around your hemlocks. <laughs> uh, we needed to have some data to prove yeah. that this will work." So we did a, a number of a couple of different studies where we had hemlocks in pots and we infested them with the adelgid and we put them under different levels of shade using shade cloth and we saw that yeah there is this response um and well in those studies we saw in the sunlight the adelgid populations crashed right uh, but we also saw that being in the sun had huge, uh, significant benefits for the overall crown health and carbon balance of the tree and they were improving in health so okay we call those the garden studies, right? We mm -hmm. had armed with that data. We then wrote some proposals and went to some land managers and said, hey, let us uh, cut some gaps so we can see if this works on a tree that's not in a pot, right? We want to do this in the forest, right? Yeah. So that's what got us started. That's awesome. So what do you guys uh, basically found with all of this? I know that you uh, set up some plots in different places. So what was the basically the main results of the study? Yeah, so the main results were that we... So we cut gaps of different sizes, big what mm -hmm. we called big gaps and large gaps. And we, we created those gaps by felling trees or by girdling um, trees in, in the area we wanted the gap. And then within each replication, we also had a control tree that we obviously we didn't do anything mm -hmm. to at all. And uh, what we saw is that in the trees that we created gaps around, um, that we saw a huge improvement in the overall health of the crown. Like the trees greened up, they filled out, they looked, they began to look more and more every year like a normal healthy hemlock, right? And to varying degrees based on the size of the gap and the way we created it. But all of our gap treatments improved the health of the tree. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, it's great. So it was super encouraging. Now I mentioned in our garden studies that when we, put hemlocks in the sun that were uh, the adelgid populations crashed. Mm -hmm. We didn't see that in the forest. Oh, okay. Right. So if we think about our largest gap that we created by felling, right. And so that's about, um, I think about a quarter acre gap around this tree. Right. So we, we opened it up, gave it a lot of sunlight. Um, so those trees look great 
right? Really low foliar transparency, right? So not much sunlight coming through. So it's got a really nice thick crown. Mm -hmm. uh, putting it, cranking out new growth every year, covered in indulgence, absolutely covered up, right? Um, which is, we were kind of like, well, that's too bad, but the trees are still looking healthy, yeah. right? Yeah, in there. <laughs> yeah. So, and really what we think, you know, getting back to that, that question about how the indulgent feeds and what it's yeah. actually doing in, inside the tree, um, extracting all those stored nutrients, uh, what we've, we don't understand the mechanism yet, but we have to dig in on that. But what we think we're probably doing, we're putting the tree at a carbon advantage, right? Because we're giving it more sunlight so it can have more photosynthesis. We've removed a lot of the neighboring competition so it has more access to soil resources. Um, so it's just able to sort of outgrow the impact of the adult, right? It's replenishing, it's, 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 creating enough energy to feed the adult and itself, right? That's, a, I think, mm. a good way to think about it. So do you think that, you know, thinking about the way this could be implemented in a larger scale, right, for like landowners and, and you know, nat natural forests as well, um, do you imagine a combination between, you know, the canopy gaps plus uh, some sort of chemical control as well? How do you see this, like, actually being implemented, g given the data that you already have? Yeah, so... Uh, that's something uh, we think a lot about. Yeah, you, know, you think about shortcomings, right? You yeah. Know, where where are we with this now, right? And that's the next question. What we did in this gap study, um, you know, particularly our larger gap, that's a pretty significant amount of timber we removed to make that happen, right? Probably not really logistically feasible when you think about it on a stand scale, mm. right? So that's the next step um, to figure out how do we take this approach. Um, and how do we apply it at a stand level? And so we have active projects and graduate students working on this question now. Um, so we're lo looking at larger scales of stand thinning. Um, and then they are also looking at what's happening with chemical control and biological control in these areas um, where we've done the tree releases. And do the predators like the sunlight or do they leave the trees because they yeah. want to go feed on trees in the shade? Um, if we've given the tree a lot of sunlight, is it metabolizing uh, the, the insecticide more quickly? So you don't get as long-term control in the tree. And interestingly, the, the study that we just talked about, the gap study, we actually took those gaps, that, that existing infrastructure, mm -hmm. and we applied a biological control and chemical control study on top of it where we can okay. begin to evaluate those things. So basically you're starting to evaluate that. Um, yeah. Do you think it's going to be any difference between, you know, the latitude where you guys are looking at different plots or? Yeah. So that's another good question. Um, and what we did see in our study is that it, the if treatments were most effective in the south, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, and uh, we saw less of a response uh, the further north we went. Part of that is we in the north we did not get um, as consistent adulgent densities and impacts mm. on the trees as we would have liked uh, because we had these polar vortex events, right? Mm -hmm. And as we said, the adulgent is very sensitive to extreme winter cold, particularly yeah. if you get a polar vortex where temperature drops really, really quickly, right? Because remember, the, the adulgent is dormant during the summer, active in the winter, actively feeding, right? And so if you get a, you think back to last Christmas where in, even in yeah. North Carolina on the 23rd, we dropped from 55 degrees to single digits within 12 hours, right? The adult does, is not going to like those types of conditions. So and we had yeah. a couple of those impact our more Northern sites. And just to clarify, our more, most Northern sites were Maryland. Right. We, we didn't move this up into New England yet. Right. Uh, we have a new study we're going to install in Pennsylvania. And there are some folks in Nova Scotia um, that, that are dealing with the adelgid now that they're going to be doing some of this stand thinning themselves. So that'll give us an opportunity to evaluate really at the northern extreme of the hemlock range, which will be good. Another thing we haven't done this. Everything we've done so far has been in mixed stands. Right. Mm. Mixed the, the hemlock hardwood, because in the southern Appalachians, that's where most of our hemlock occurs, right? You know, pure, these big, beautiful, pure hemlock stands don't really happen in the south. We get areas where you get a lot of hemlock. Um, a lot of those have been killed by the adelgid, right? 
But as you get uh, further into the Northeast and then over in the Midwest, you get these big, beautiful forests that are almost pure hemlock, right? Uh, and so that's another question that we haven't answered yet is how do we apply this to the pure stand, right? And that's a little bit harder to get interest in doing because we would be cutting a lot of hemlock in order yeah, to Yeah, I was going to ask. So species. I imagine you actually don't have many uh, replicates there up north with, you know, these massive canopy gaps as well. Right. Yeah, we don't. So, yeah. But I mean, I think people are encouraged by our results and people are interested in in applying this. So, yeah, absolutely. We'll absolutely. So yes. thinking about, you know, the, the, the next steps that you guys have, uh, you were mentioning, you know, looking at the Northern distribution, looking at the combination with um, biological control uh, and, and these canopy gaps, what other like kind of like big questions do you guys have in terms of, um, you know, this IPM toolkit for the, the Delgid? Um, well, for me, I, I think, um, uh, anytime we're going to think of, think about IPM, I think we should be thinking about the resistance question and if that mm -hmm. could be part of it. Cause, um, another area of research that we're involved in is, um, hemlock reintroduction. So we have studies where we've gone in and replanted hemlock mm -hmm. and are looking at what are the silvicultural strategies that are going to be necessary to reintroduce the species, right? Cause it's a, yeah. It's a considered a keystone species, right? If you remove it from its ecosystem, which the adelgid has, that ecosystem changes at a fundamental level. So reintroducing the species is not going to be as easy as just going and tossing some seed out there. We're going to have to give it some help. Yeah. So we're beginning to evaluate, or we're not beginning, we've been working on this for a number of years as well. Uh, we're starting to look at that um, in a few different studies we have in the field. Uh, working primarily with trees, we are chemically protecting from the adelgid, right? Uh, because we don't have a resistant genotype. And I think um, if we can get there, whether it's a pure species or a hybrid, um, that's a really fundamental part of restoration, I think, that we have uh, a, a genotype that is at least has some tolerance or resistance. It doesn't have to be perfectly yeah. tolerant or resistant, but it just has something that helps it survive um, a little bit longer so that all we can bring together all of these IPM strategies. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine, you know, like a combination of these canopy gaps in these uh, reintroduction areas combined with like chemical um, treatment for at least like a few years while it actually gets established might be just enough to like <laughs> make it happen. But um, I would imagine like this is going to be uh, several years uh, before we have some actual data on this. Yeah, yeah, we we still got a long way to go with this, right? So, <laughs> for sure. Well, I, I really, really appreciate uh, you talking to us about uh, the Adelgid. Very interesting for sure. Uh, so thank you for your time. And yeah, great having you here. Uh, thank you, Damien. It was great. Always great to interact with you. And hopefully we can meet up and hang out in Montevideo or, or somewhere yeah. else in Uruguay sometime. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Have a great day. All right, thank you. Thank you for joining into this discussion with Dr. Robert Jaton on some new management strategies for the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you want to support the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. And as always, have an awesome week and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>